Lactation. Introduction. The fundamental secretory unit of the breast is the alveolus, which is surrounded by contractile myoepithelial cells and adipose cells. These alveoli are organized into lobules, each of which drains into a ductule. A group of 15 to 20 ductules drain into a duct, which widens at the ampulla, forming a small reservoir. The lactiferous duct carries the secretions to the outside. Breast development at puberty depends on several hormones, but primarily on the estrogens and progesterone. During pregnancy, gradual increases in levels of prolactin, PRL, and human chorionic somatomammotropin, as well as very high levels of estrogens and progesterone, lead to full development of the breast. Hormones affecting the breast are mammogenic hormones, promoting the proliferation of alveolar and duct cells. Ductal growth is carried out by estrogen, growth hormone, cortisol, and relaxin. Lobular alveolar growth carried out by estrogen, growth factor, cortisol, prolactin, and relaxin. Lactogenic hormones, promoting initiation of milk production by alveolar cells. These include prolactin, human chorionic somatomammotropic hormone, cortisol, insulin, IGF-1, thyroid hormones, and growth hormones. Withdrawal of estrogen and progesterone can also have a lactogenic effect. Galactokinetic hormone, promoting contraction of myoepithelial cells and thus milk ejection. These include oxytocin and vasopressin, which is 1% to 20% as powerful as oxytocin. Galactopoietic hormone, maintains milk production after it has been established. These include prolactin, which is the primary hormone, and cortisol and other metabolic hormones. Composition of breast milk. The epithelial alveolar cells of the mammary gland secrete the complex mixture of sugars, proteins, lipids, and other substances that constitute milk. The composition of human milk differs from that of human colostrum, the thin, yellowish milk-like substance secreted during the first several days after parturition, and cow's milk. Cow's milk has nearly three times more protein than human milk, almost exclusively a result of its much higher casein concentration. Cow's milk also has a higher electrolyte content. The difference in composition between human and cow's milk is important because a newborn, with its delicate gastrointestinal tract, may not tolerate the more concentrated cow's milk. Secretion of the complex mixture of constituents that make up milk are carried out by five major routes. Secretory pathway. The milk proteins, lactobumin and casein, are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and sorted to the Golgi apparatus. Here, alveolar cells add calcium and phosphate to the lumen. Lactosynthetase in the lumen of the Golgi catalyzes the synthesis of lactose, the major carbohydrate. Lactosynthetase has two components, a galactosyl transferase and lactobumin, both made in the endoplasmic reticulum. Water enters the secretory vesicle by osmosis. Finally, exocytosis discharges the contents of the vesicle into the lumen of the alveolus. Transcellular endocytosis exocytosis the basolateral membrane takes up maternal immunoglobulins by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Following transcellular transport of these vesicles to the apical membrane, the cell secretes these immunoglobulins, primarily IgA, by exocytosis. The gastrointestinal tract of the infant takes up these immunoglobulins, which are important for conferring immunity before the infant's own immune system matures. Lipid pathway. Epithelial cells synthesize short-chain fatty acids. However, the longer-chain fatty acids, greater than 16 carbons, that predominate in milk originate primarily from the diet or from fat stores. The fatty acids form into lipid droplets and move to the apical membrane. As the apical membrane surrounds the droplets and pinches off, it secretes the milk lipids into the lumen in a membrane-bound sac. Transcellular salt and water transport. A variety of transport processes at the apical and basolateral membranes move small electrolytes from the interstitial fluid into the lumen of the alveolus. 
water follows an osmotic gradient generated primarily by lactose. Present at a final concentration of 200 millimoles and, to a lesser extent, by the electrolytes. Paracellular pathway. Salt and water can also move into the lumen of the alveolus via the tight junctions. In addition, cells, primarily leukocytes, also squeeze between cells and enter the milk. Hormones affecting the mammary gland during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Prolactin. Prolactin is a polypeptide hormone that is structurally related to growth hormone, placental variant growth hormone, and human chorionic somatomammotropic hormone. Like growth hormone, prolactin is made and released in the anterior pituitary. However, lactotrophs rather than somatotrophs are responsible for prolactin synthesis. Another difference is that whereas growth hormone releasing hormones stimulate somatotrophs to release growth hormone, Dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin from lactotrophs. Thus, it is the removal of inhibition that promotes prolactin release. The actions of prolactin on the mammary glands include the promotion of mammary growth, mammogenic effect, initiation of milk secretion, lactogenic effect, and maintenance of milk production once it has been established. Galactopoietic effect. Prolactin binds to a tyrosine kinase-associated receptor in the same family of receptors as the growth hormone receptor. Prolactin receptors, which have equal affinities for growth hormone, are present in tissues such as breast, ovary, and liver. Presumably via pathways initiated by protein phosphorylation at tyrosine residues, prolactin stimulates transcription of the genes that encode several milk proteins, including lactobumin and casein. Suckling is the most powerful physiologic stimulus for prolactin release. Nipple stimulation triggers prolactin secretion via an afferent neural pathway through the spinal cord, inhibiting dopaminergic neurons in the median eminence of the hypothalamus. Dopamine normally inhibits prolactin release from the lactotrophs. It's called a prolactin inhibitory factor, PIF. Thus, because suckling decreases dopamine delivery via the portal vessels, it relieves the inhibition on the lactotrophs in the anterior pituitary and stimulates burst of prolactin release. Suckling has four major effects. First, it stimulates sensory nerves, which carry the signal from the breast to the spinal cord, where they synapse with neurons that carry the signal to the brain. Second, in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, the afferent input from the nipple inhibits neurons that release dopamine. Dopamine normally travels via the hypothalamic portal system to the anterior pituitary, where it inhibits prolactin release by lactotrophs. Thus, inhibition of dopamine release leads to an increase in prolactin release. Third, in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus, the afferent input from the nipple triggers a production and release of oxytocin in the posterior pituitary. Fourth, in the preoptic area and arcuate nucleus, the afferent input from the nipple inhibits GnRH release. GnRH normally travels via the hypothalamic portal system to the anterior pituitary, where it stimulates the synthesis and release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Thus, inhibiting GnRH release inhibits FSH and LH release and thereby inhibits the ovarian cycle. Several factors act as prolactin-releasing factors. Thyrotropin-releasing hormone, angiotensin II, substance P, beta-endorphin, and vasopressin. In lactating women, thyrotropin-releasing hormone leads to increased milk production. Estradiol modulates prolactin release in two ways. First, estradiol increases the sensitivity of lactotroph to stimulation by thyrotropin-releasing hormone. Second, Estradiol decreases the sensitivity of the lactotroph to inhibition by dopamine. During the first three weeks of the neonatal period, maternal prolactin levels remain tonically elevated. If the mother does not nurse her young, prolactin levels generally fall to non-pregnant levels after one to two weeks. If the mother does breastfeed, increased prolactin secretion is maintained for as long as suckling continues. Suckling causes episodic increases in prolactin secretion with each feeding, thus producing peaks in prolactin levels that are superimposed on the elevated baseline prolactin levels. After the infant completes a session of nursing,
Prolactin levels return to their elevated baseline and remain there until the infant nurses again. Oxytocin Oxytocin, which can promote uterine contraction, also promotes milk ejection by stimulating the contraction of the network of myoepithelial cells surrounding the alveoli and ducts of the breast. Galactokinetic Effect Nursing can sometimes cause uterine cramps. During nursing, suckling stimulates nerve endings in the nipple and triggers rapid bursts of oxytocin release. This neurogenic reflex is transmitted through the spinal cord, the midbrain, and the hypothalamus, where it stimulates neurons in the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei that release oxytocin from their nerve endings in the posterior pituitary. From the posterior pituitary, oxytocin enters the systemic circulation, eventually reaching the myoepithelial cells that are arranged longitudinally on the lactiferous ducts and around the alveoli in the breast. Because these cells have oxytocin receptors, oxytocin causes them to contract by mechanisms that are similar to those for the contraction of uterine smooth muscle. The result is to promote the release of pre-existing milk, known as the letdown reflex. In addition to the suckling stimulus, a vast array of psychic stimuli emanating from the infant, as well as neuroendocrine factors, also promote oxytocin release. The sight or sound of an infant may trigger milk letdown, a phenomenon that is observed in many mammals. Thus, the posterior pituitary releases oxytocin episodically, even in anticipation of suckling. This psychogenic reflex is suppressed when fear, anger, or other stresses are encountered, thus inhibiting oxytocin release and suppressing milk outflow. Cyclical Changes in the Breast Lactation normally does not occur until the end of pregnancy. The cyclical changes take place in the breast during the menstrual cycle. Estrogen causes proliferation of mammary ducts, whereas progesterone causes growth of lobules and alveoli. The breast swelling, tenderness, and pain experienced by many women during the 10 days preceding menstruation are probably due to distension of the ducts, hyperemia, and edema of the interstitial tissue of the breast. All these changes regress, along with the symptoms, during menstruation. Ovarian Cycle and Suckling Normally, GnRH travels via the portal vessels to the gonadotrophs in the anterior pituitary. Suckling likely reduces the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone by neurons in the arcuate nucleus and the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. Thus, decreased GnRH release that is induced by suckling reduces the secretion of follicle-stimulating hormone and LH and has a negative effect on ovarian function. As a result, breastfeeding delays ovulation and normal menstrual cycles. If the mother continues to nurse her infant for a prolonged period, ovulatory cycles eventually resume. Suckling intensity and frequency, which decrease with the introduction of supplementary foods to the infant, Determine the duration of anovulation and amenorrhea in well-nourished women. In breastfeeding women, the period of anovulation averages 18 to 24 months. If the mother does not nurse her young after delivery, ovulatory cycles resume, on average, 8 to 10 weeks after delivery, with a range of up to 18 weeks. <laughs>